Hi, uh, my name is Rachel Vincent, and I work at the Recurse Center, which is formerly known as Hacker School, uh, for a retreat for computer programmers. Uh, I'm excited to talk to all of you today about strategies for building good communication patterns on small teams. So while I'll be using examples that are specific to my workplace and past experiences, I'll also be suggesting ways that you all might be able to incorporate these strategies into your own workplaces and communities. I'm assuming that all of you have worked on, do work on, or will work on small teams, uh, whether that's at your job or in community organizing or somewhere else. Uh, disclaimer time. So the ideas I'm about to discuss probably won't work well or fix a very toxic environment. They're best implemented in an environment where folks have a basic level of respect for one another, uh, or in a new environment when a company or a community starts or experiences a bunch of growth. Uh, you need a solid foundation of trust and respect for these roles to work. I'm really lucky to genuinely like all of my coworkers. Uh, sometimes that's not the case. And in that case, sometimes it's best to get out of Dodge. So how does good communication go bad? We develop unique communication patterns with anybody that we spend a lot of time with. So these patterns can include productive and destructive behaviors all at once. Maybe you have a friend who you're particularly self-deprecating with, or a coworker who gives you useful feedback in a way that comes across as an attack. It can be hard to recognize when a suddenly destructive behavior pattern starts to emerge, which is why it's good to sort of set ground rules early on. So step zero, outline a shared vocabulary and expectations. This is a step you'll need to repeat and check in on constantly. Humans are messy and human relationships are always works in progress. This talk is full of examples of shared vocabulary and expectations, and I'm sure that if you reflect in your own relationships, you'll find more. Speaking of those examples, uh, today I'm gonna talk about three categories of fairly common problematic behaviors and ways to address them proactively. So I'm gonna talk about RC social rules, about interrupting, and about giving and receiving direct feedback. So example number one, uh, as I mentioned earlier, I work at the Recur Center and we are known uh, for our social rules. Um, so we have four of them. Uh, we use them and we sort of stick to them because we have batches of new folks starting every six weeks. So we onboard 30 people every six weeks. And keeping our working environment productive is very, very important to us. So to that end, we have named uh, and identified common negative behaviors that tend to emerge in technical communities. And we also give, ways of folk, give folks a way to call them out in a lightweight sort of manner. So the four social rules, no well actuallys, no feigning surprise, no backseat driving, no subtle isms. I'll go into all those in a moment. But first, uh, the meta rule. So in order for the social rules to work, there's a meta rule that has to be implemented as well. If you're called out for breaking a social rule, you argue with the person, you make the correction and carry on. You recognize that they cared and respected you enough to tell you something tough. It's not their job to educate you too. I have some cats to help me with the first three of these. Uh, so <laughs> number one is no well actually is. This is a behavior that's joked about quite a bit in technical communities. It's also known as being pedantic. Um, no well actually was the first social rule that was implemented at RC because two of the founders were well actually in each other so much they found it hard to work together. Uh, it was hurting their ability to communicate on a day-to-day -day basis. So well actually someone looks kind of like this. So person A, Ada Lovelace's notes on Babbage's analytical engine were lettered A to G. And in note F, she described what is considered the first computer program and algorithm, person B. Well, it was actually note G in which she described the algorithm. So this is a classic, well, actually, person B interrupted person A to add a fact that didn't substantively add to the conversation and turn the focus to them. Many, many people do this. It can feel good to correct someone, especially if you're right on some sort of arcane, tiny fact. Uh, the key here is to reflect on whether you're contributing or picking on something that's tangential to the conversation and derails it. Uh -huh. Uh, so number two, no feigning surprise. It's <laughs> my favorite one. Uh, <laughs> so feigning surprise is when you express surprise, real or not, at someone not knowing someone. It looks like this and also like this. Uh, so person A, hey, what's Erlang? Person B, what have you never heard of Erlang? So 
What feigning surprise does here is make person B feel superior to person A for happening to know something person A currently does not. But realistically, everyone has gaps in their knowledge. By person B focusing on the gap makes person A probably less likely to express ignorance or ask questions around person B in the future, and that seriously hampers the likelihood that they'll learn from each other or work together well. Number three is no backseat driving. Proud to have found a cat on the internet for this. Uh, so backseat driving is perhaps one of the subtlest of the social rules. So when someone overhears two or more people working on something and lobs advice or an opinion across the room without engaging fully in the conversation. This can lead to that person giving less useful advice or to the initial conversation being completely derailed. Sometimes people want to work through something on their own and by half listening to a conversation, it's likely the backseat driver doesn't have all the information they need to really help. Rather, they're projecting mastery of a subject while not really deigning to engage with the people involved. It looks kind of like this. So person A is talking to person B. Oh, you're right, the module expects Unicode. Person B, ah, okay, I, person C, you should just use Python 3. Person A, hey, you're backseat driving a little bit there. Uh, so backseat driving, as you can see here, um, it's not terrifically horrible, uh, but over the long term, what it does is sort of make per people A and B feel like person C doesn't care enough to actually work with them and talk to them about whatever they're working on and just sort of wants to like lob some, some shots in there. Uh, so finally, no subtle isms for the social roles. I don't have a cat here because it's not cute. Uh, subtle isms are subtle expressions of racism, sexism, ageism, homophobia, transphobia, and other kinds of oppression. So it's not when someone says, Women can't program, that's overt sexism. Subtleisms look more like boxing out the only woman at a whiteboarding session or conversation, or saying something like, Psh, the iPhone is so easy to use, my grandmother could use it. Uh, or asking where somebody is really from based on their perceived ethnic background, or uh, assuming that someone isn't an engineer because of their ethnic background or gender presentation. Cool, so the social roles. If you'd like to implement the social rules in your own workplace or community, here's one way to do it. Explain the why of each rule, so why are these behaviors damaging? Get explicit buy-in from everyone involved. Be committed to calling folks out, so model good behavior. And finally, remember the meta rule. Everyone, when being called out, apologize and move on. Okay, number two, interrupting. Uh, so, for many folks, interrupting is a huge issue in the workplace. It's even worse for people who identify as women. Uh, there are many studies about this, too, uh, that I'm citing here, uh, showed that men interrupt women 33% more often than they interrupt men in conversation. And a study of transcripts from 12 years of Supreme Court hearings found that male justices interrupt female justices three times more often than they interrupt other male justices. Being interrupted makes it hard to speak. Uh, this is very important to recognize we, have, we all have different communication styles, and some people interrupt more than, other, uh, more than others in casual conversation and in workplace situations. But for folks from marginalized groups, interrupting is often used as and feels like a power play. There are two common types of interrupting, affirmative interrupting and derailing interrupting. Affirmative interrupting is when someone says like, oh yes, mm-hmm, as someone else is talking. Derailing interrupting is when someone cuts someone else off to interject with a thought, a roadblock, or a question. So affirmative interrupting is less damaging, but it still slows things down. For spoken conversations, one thing we've adopted at RC is the finger waggle. So this comes from uh, the Occupy Wall Street organizers, and it looks like this. So if somebody is saying something that I agree with, I do this. Uh, it's meant to signal agreement silently. Think about gestures all members of your team or group can do to signal agreement without vocalizing and stopping the person who's speaking. For written conversations, we use a thumbs up or thumbs down emoji and a scale of plus one to minus one signaling agreement on a scale from strongly agree to disagree and block. The reason that we do this is to cut down on conversational clutter and to keep the issue that's being discussed centered. Derailing interrupting, uh, in my opinion, is much worse. So that can be also harder to call out and fix. So for me personally, being interrupted during a meeting makes me pretty angry, and it also makes me freeze up. At worst, I lose the thread of what I was saying, 
and I almost never register what the other person just said because I'm trying to adjust. It took a very long time for me to say something to my coworkers, but I was happy I did because we all set about fixing it as a team. Uh, so naming the behavior worked really well for me, and I was able to go from <laughs> feeling like a cat on the left who is screaming, uh, which was me inter internally. Uh, I named the behavior, admitted that I did it too, and gave my coworkers direct feedback about it. So we've all been more conscious of it since, and now I feel a bit more like the cat on the right who's very happy and smiling come meeting time. So cool. This brings me to my final uh, class of behaviors, uh, direct feedback, which is very, very difficult to foster. For me, it's kind of like the pinnacle of great team communication is when you can give and receive direct feedback pretty seamlessly. Um, so there are a ton of different power dynamics that may or may not be present in situations where direct feedback is needed. So it's important to recognize those, figure out what they are in your situation. Your mileage may vary very, very much. Uh, I don't have a lot of time, so I can't run through a lot of those different sort of permutations, but I'm sure if you reflect, you'll sort of see what they are in your case. One cool thing, uh, one weird trick, is that by implementing social rules or a no interrupting scheme, you've already started giving direct feedback to your coworkers in a regular lightweight way, so it will be easier, hypothetically, to give them feedback in a more direct heavyweight way. So I've seen direct feedback done very well in two different places in my life and writing workshops and martial arts classes. So in the best writing workshops I've taken, I found that when there's a clear moderator or teacher and everyone, number one, wants and expects to give and receive feedback, give and receive feedback on their work, and number two, respects the ground rules of giving one positive note for every negative note, the feedback that's given is usually helpful and thoughtful. So on a team, you can perhaps add a rule about having a constructive note along with a negative note or designate someone as a meeting facilitator for tougher conversations. Uh, so martial arts classes are pretty different from writing workshops and hopefully most work environments, but I've seen a lot of parallels. So uh, one big parallel is you expect feedback and there's again a teacher-student dynamic. In the best boxing and Krav Maga classes I've taken, the instructor thoughtfully explains the technique, offers corrections, and watches until you get them right. I think the most important part of this type of practice is that the point of direct feedback here is to catch and correct form and instincts early and then reinforce proper form so you don't get hurt. On a team, this translates to being able to call out when behaviors and processes are bothering you before they become insidious. So uh, we're trying to make direct feedback a more integral and regular part of our workplace right now. Still a work in progress. One hurdle we recognize, which you may have also noticed, is that when people try to give feedback in writing, it comes across as, it can come across as super sort of negative and attacky and very serious. Whereas if you're talking to someone one-on-one, -on -one, it's much easier to come across in a casual way and to remember that you're friends. Um, so this was happening to us a lot. We communicate on Zulip, which is kind of like Slack. It's an internal chat platform. So we decided to do something kind of silly, uh, which, we add a small, silly emoji dinosaur. There are three choices uh, before we give anybody direct constructive feedback. So something that might come across as a personal attack is mitigated a little bit, and it's sort of a reminder for everyone that, like, hey, we love you, but this thing is really bothering me, and let's work on it together. Uh, so I used a dinosaur when I called out the interrupting thing being something that was really bothering me, and it helped me call it out in the first place. So, as I mentioned earlier, direct feedback can be a thorny thing to implement and maintain. And maintain. Uh, setting a foundation is important here, so be clear that it's important that folks are able to learn from one another and give each other feedback when something is wrong. Model good communication uh, aggressively for the first few months you're adopting these policies so that folks feel comfortable following suit. And start by introducing smaller systems, like the social rules or the finger waggle, to get people used to giving and receiving feedback from one another. Uh, so the hopeful results of good communication patterns. Hopefully, you are shifting the work of reducing harmful behaviors from individuals to the group. You're setting clear, shared baseline expectations for behavior for everyone. You're shifting the education burden off of the people who usually bear it. And ideally, everyone can better focus on working together. Cool. So that's all I have. Um, I don't think I have time for questions, because I'm exactly at 15 minutes. 
but I'm happy to chat with anybody later or take questions if you have them. Thank you.